It was a time of great hope. After months of violent protests that left many killed, Sudan's revolution seemed to have triumphed in April 2019. The dictator Omar al-Bashir was overthrown. Civilians were now sitting at the negotiating table with the army generals that had replaced al-Bashir's government. After 30 years of authoritarian rule, civilians were getting a say in the future of their country. It was against this backdrop that we met Asil Diab, a Sudanese artist who had returned from the diaspora at the height of the violent protest. Her self-assigned mission was to keep the memory of those who died seeking freedom alive. She painted murals of them near the houses of their families. The artwork being there is a reminder to everyone that, you know, they died for you. We have to remember the martyrs because at the end of the day, it all comes down to they went out to protest for us. This art forces you to speak about what's happening, you know. Today, it's not just that specific person, but it, what he died for and the cause that he died for. Now, two years later, Asil is disappointed. The transitional government had promised justice for the killed and injured protesters. Promises that have come to nothing, say the families of the victims. The martyrs are still trying to look and find and get that justice. I've visited uh, so many of these uh, families, the martyrs' families, and they all say the same thing. There's no justice. There's no clarification of how they're going to get that justice and when they're going to get that justice. So things are very vague at this moment. They kind of gave up hope, basically. There has been no contact from the government two years later, calling these martyrs' families and saying, you know, we're going to get your rights by, you know, uh, uh, doing a hearing on this date or compensating you on this way. The worsening economic situation is also weighing on the lives of people in Sudan. Under Bashir's rule, the country was cut off economically because of sanctions. The transitional government has succeeded in removing Sudan from the United States' state sponsors of terrorism list. That's paved the way for the country to rejoin the global economy. But change is slow to reach the common man. And like many countries around the world, the COVID pandemic has hit Sudan very hard. People are tired now. You know, there's electricity cuts for half of the day. There's no gas, no petrols for their cars. People are just tired. They're living day by day. I think you reach a point in your life where you see that so much time has passed that you just want to let it go, you know, and you want to leave. Despite the challenges, Asil is not willing to give up on the promise of the revolution. Her latest project was a public mural depicting the former dictator Omar al-Bashir as the coronavirus, something that would have been unthinkable under his rule. She says she wants to send a message to her fellow countrymen and women with this piece. Just as we have beaten a dictator, we can beat the virus and overcome anything. DW's A. Ibrahim filed the report you just saw, and she joins me now in studio. Good to see you, A. So, uncomfortable living conditions, the rising price of bread triggered the Sudan Revolution. Has life improved for the young people who took to the streets? You know, Christine, nobody thought this was easy. Even two years ago when I was in Khartoum at the height of the euphoria, I, the young people there didn't strike me as naive. They knew the kind of mammoth challenge that was facing their country. But at the same time, two years later, the harsh living conditions are starting to really take their toll. And even the most optimistic among them are now, you know, feeling the brunt of this. You know, remember this, this started as a protest against a hike in the price of bread. Yeah. But in addition to that, there are the frustrations with the political transitions, uh, transition. There are oftentimes been, been this feeling that the military side of the government is sort of co-opting the power meant for the civilian uh, part of the government. So the issue of the killed protests is one thing, but so things like the transitional legislative council, that's behind. You know, this was the legislative council that was supposed to be put together to represent Sudan more widely. And also there's no constitutional uh, conference also as promised. That is also behind. But there have been some improvements in freedom of speech. That right. is something that I hear time and time again 
that, uh, you know, that situation has improved and people are able to express their frustrations, at least something that was not the case under the Bashir right. regime. Aya, women were at the forefront of the revolution. Are women better off in Sudanese society today? We all remember the image of that young Sudanese woman on the car, you know, chanting. She became the symbol of uh, this revolution. And certainly there have been some improvement, uh, you know, in the situation of women. The first transitional cabinet uh, saw Sudan's first ever female foreign minister, youth minister in the first transitional cabinet. There have been two, was also a woman. Uh, female genital mutilation has been criminalized in Sudan, a, cha a challenge and a demand by uh, feminist activists for years. And also some outdated laws about how women should dress in public have also been scrapped. But something that even Asil told me, you know, as a woman who's, uh, you know, her, her job uh, ha means that she has to be outside, you know, this is a huge taboo. She says, you know, even though there have been improvements in these laws, there's still the social perception. It's still, for example, difficult for her to go and, you know, do her uh, murals. So, the laws are taking steps, yes. but uh, social um, perception still has to be changed. That's TW's Aya Ibrahim. Thank you, Aya. Now, in January, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appointed Volker Pates as the new special representative for Sudan. Uh, Mr. Pates joins us now from Khartoum. Welcome to DW News Africa. It has been two years since Omar al Bashir's ouster. Have things improved uh, for the people of Sudan since he left? Well, uh, things have improved, uh, but uh, challenges remain, and the challenges are are, are enormous. Uh, things have improved on the on the peace front, as it were. Things have improved on the political transition front or track, but we still have economic problems, so actually, which actually have become deeper, and we still have tensions between different parts of the population, particularly in Darfur, that have played out very, very dramatically and negatively in the last couple of mm. I do want to pick up on the point uh, that you're making about Darfur. There has been recent unrest in, in the region, as you've been saying, and I'd like for our viewers to hear one eyewitness account before I ask you my next question. This is a large fire in Abu Zah camp. It's a massive fire. It will burn everything. Look at this fire. The rapid support forces have rocket-propelled grenades. They have targeted the Abu Zah camp. Look, everyone, this is what Sudan is going to be like. So, so an eyewitness account from the ground there, dozens uh, have already died in intercommunal violence. Many rebel groups are not on board with that Juba peace agreement. Um, Ambassador Pettis, how fragile is the security situation in Sudan? The situation in Sudan as such is not fragile, but the situation in Darfur, and particularly in West Darfur, is extremely fragile. And what we have seen in the town of Jinaina, where your eyewitness uh, is and is reporting from. We have seen it in exactly that town for the third time now in less than a year and a half. It's the same constellation of intercommunal clashes, which, a um, little bit less politely said, is clashes between different tribes. It is about land rights. It is about who is allowed to live where and to be active in agriculture or have his birds where. It is also, unfortunately, about who is getting aid from the international community. Um, Ambassador, this violence in this in, in Darfur region, as you're saying, it's not a Sudan problem, it's more a regional problem, but it has been linked to the withdrawal of UN peacekeeping forces that were there. Was that a mistake by, by, uh, by the UN? Does the UN need to reconsider the decision to withdraw those peacekeeping forces from the region then? Well, I didn't take this decision and uh, the UNITAMS mission wasn't involved. So uh, uh, you would have to ask this question to members of the Security Council who took the decision. So as a new UN mission, what we can do is we can support the Sudanese government and Sudanese society in becoming better on protecting civilians. But now it is clearly the government responsibility 
The government is realizing that this responsibility is huge. Some people, as you rightly say, even governors in Darfur are not happy with the drawdown of UNAMIT, but that decision has been taken and it seems to be irreversible. Ambassador, going back to 2019, um, I specifically remember the statement by the UN condemning the violence and force that Sudanese officials had used against protesters. Dozens of people were killed. Uh, and, and, and as we've been listening to, to young people in our report, no one's been brought to account for that. Have you raised this matter in your engagements uh, with the people in charge of Sudan right now? We are discussing these matters all the time. Yes, we are in contact with the government. We are in contact with the, uh, with the legal authorities here. Um, what we insist upon when we speak about these issues is that rule of law should be applied duly. I mean, it's not about simply putting people in prison. And actually, there are a couple of these perpetrators or suspected perpetrators in prison right now. Um, but what is more important from the UN perspective is that even suspected perpetrators of these kind of atrocities uh, will be brought to a legal court procedure and proper rule of law will be applied. And that is indeed oh. what we are talking to. On uh, that note, Ambassador. Sorry if I I'm may sorry. interrupt you there. On that note, I, I want to interrupt you there because the government, the Sudanese government, has pardoned a former member of the Janjaweed militia who the UN sanctioned for alleged atrocities in Darfur, are pardons uh, that uh, are pardons that conducive to, to peace and reconciliation in Sudan? Well, it's a very delicate measure uh, matter. This this person who was pardoned was actually not imprisoned for the atrocities he allegedly was part of, and he has been sanctioned uh, for by the by the United Nations. He was he was imprisoned for. Um, his role in a conflict between government forces and his own ones. Now, I think that uh, this person being on the UN sanctions list, uh, it is a right decision not to remove him from this list. Uh, so we still expect the Sudanese government uh, to work together with the United Nations and with the ICC here and uh, hand over suspected persons to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court. Uh, Ambassador, what needs to happen next in the region? Well, if you ask for the region, there are a couple of other issues. Uh, we have these tensions between Ethiopia and Sudan, and we can only, uh, and we do ask everybody to de-escalate and not further escalate, not even rhetorically, uh, the situation between the Sudan and Ethiopia. It's both about border issues. Uh, as well as uh, the dam that is being built in Ethiopia and raises some concern in the downstream countries, particularly here in Sudan, but also in Egypt. In Sudan, there is a clear agenda of how to move forward. Um, the next step, according to the agenda which the Sudanese set themselves in their constitutional declaration after the revolution, is to appoint a transitional legislative council so as to have more legitimacy and more participation, more inclusivity uh, when it comes to taking an uh, important decision. Then constitutional conversations have to start, uh, very importantly, uh, in order to have a constitution in place before the elections uh, at the end of the transition period. And the third enormously important political step is here to start peace negotiations with parties, holdout groups, as some people say, who have not signed up to the Juba peace agreement of last year. And that is the UN envoy to Sudan, Ambassador Volker Pertes, talking to us from Khartoum. Thank you. Thank you very much.